Stay a while and listen as I tell you a tale. One held between the high heavens, known as Blizzard Entertainment when they make good games, and the burning hells, known as Blizzard Entertainment the rest of the time. A conflict that mortals like us are but another pawn in. A pawn to be exploited for money from a cash grab mobile game that even a treasure goblin would find too rich. A pawn to be ground up and spat out by the meat grinder of poor game launches. A pawn to be exploited for money. Again, but in a different way this time. These are the many scandals of the Diablo franchise. Let's be real, no matter how mad you get at Blizzard during this video, you're probably still gonna buy Diablo 4 all the same. When you do, be sure to practice safe gaming with Gamer Subs. Pro probably, sh probably shouldn't have picked the green flavor. Gamer Subs isn't like those other energy drink brands. For example, they don't care if I just suddenly end the- Hey guys, I just got chewed out by the brass over at Gamer Subs. Turns out they do care if I suddenly abrupt their- if Turns out they do care if I suddenly end their ads. I forgot to tell you guys about the amazing promo offer they've got right now. For 24 hours after this video goes live, use my link in the description to get free shipping on any item on their store. That includes their free sample packs. Doesn't take a genius to figure out how much that costs. It's free, it's zero dollars. It's free. After that, the code will get you 10% off anything on their website. While Diablo's player base are usually the ones receiving the short end of the raw deal, even their developers aren't immune to a scandal. <laughs> no, not that one. Uh, no, not not that one either. Um, no, not, not this one. In 1993, a studio by the name of Condor was squirted into existence by David Brevik and the Super Schnaefer brothers, Max and Eric. About nine months before Condor was due to birth Diablo 1 into the world, Blizzard's then owners, Davidson and Associates, scooped up Condor and renamed it to Blizzard North, with the original Blizzard being nicknamed Blizzard South. Despite sharing the same name, these studios were effectively autonomous from one another, which worked great for North. But things were about to take a turn for the blurst. Blizzard is somewhat of a hot potato as far as gaming corporations are concerned, constantly passing hands to whichever company has the weakest harassment enforcement policies. You may have heard recently about how Microsoft is trying to court the Darling Maiden, but this is far from the first time. In 1996, Blizzard North's owners Davidson and Associates were bought by CompuCard International, also known as Cuck, which is going to be really hard to not make a joke about. CompuCard later merged with another company, in order to form Sendent. Less than a year later, it was discovered that the cucks at Cuck had been cucking the books, lying about their profits and overstating their income to the tune of $500 million. With this revelation, Sendent's stocks plummeted from $39 to less than $10 a share, costing shareholders $14 billion, which is roughly how much money you need to max out a character in Diablo Immortal. Blizzard North's founders, who were paid in stocks instead of cash, during their company's acquisition, could only watch in horror as their money went up in flames. The team trudged on, and Blizzard was once again passed around like a joint of weed at a marijuana party, this time to Vivendi Games. 2001 saw Blizzard North begin development on Diablo 3, in a sci-fi version that followed the Warcraft Starcraft naming pattern by naming it Starblo. St Starablo. Diablo. Now, you might be wondering why Diablo 3 took 11 years to release if they began development in 2001. In 2002, Blizzard North management discovered that the company was, you guessed it, being put up for sale yet again. Much like Sneeko, the cuck incident weighed heavy on their minds, terrified of another botch sale that they had no say in. North founders Dave and the Schnaefer bros had a plan to ensure security for them and their staff. They decided they would threaten their resignation unless Vivendi gave them a seat at the negotiation table. Instead, Vivendi said, Righto mate, see you later. And by the end of the day, they were escorted from the premises of the very company they founded. Blizzard South was now in control and the mood at North immediately soured. It was announced that every employee at North would have a meeting with a manager from South in order to figure out who stays 
and who goes. Blindsided by the loss of the company's heads and the threat of losing their own jobs looming over them, employees at North became engulfed in office politics. When the guys left and it came time for our interviews and we learned that Blizzard South would be cutting some staff, everybody was out to save their butts. Anybody they had issues with, that was the time to stick it to them. I was like, I guess I should go talk to other people. That's when I realized how bad things were. The moment he stepped into the conference room turned artist lair, the pit went quiet. Rivero, Bowie, and the others glared at him until he backed out. For a second I thought, I'm gonna try reach out to the people I know. Then I realized that everyone was making lists of people they wanted to see fired. It was like, wow. This is the end. Employees discovered their fates, reality show style, by being directed to either the conference room or the kitchen. It was pretty depressing. Actually, when I walked into the room, I saw a certain person in the same room I was in, and I thought, yep, I'm gone. There's no way they're keeping him. Blizzard North was no more, and its remaining staff were shipped down to the Blizzard South office in Irvine. Almost all of the work that North had done on both Star Bliabo and Diablo 3 was scrapped which explains both Diablo 3's delayed launch and shift in design philosophy. David Brevik, one of the North founders, would later express his feelings about Diablo 3's turbulent launch. He lamented how different the final product was than what they would have made, and how important it is to keep around talented folks who understand how the franchise works. Jay Wilson, the lead designer of Diablo 3, would respond, Fuck that loser. Speaking of Diablo 3's launch, Diablo was always a single player offline game with the option to go online if you wanted to join some kid's game and scam him out of his hard earned gear. So when it was announced that Diablo 3 required a constant internet connection in order to cater for some features that nobody even wanted, people were not happy. Now, in a perfect world where globules of internet flow freely like grapes bouncing off the cleavage of a buxom wench, nobody would care. But this is not the world we live in, as much as I've tried. I've been looking forward to Diablo 3 for a decade, and Activision has managed to squash all of my excitement with a single announcement. This game is now a non-purchase. I will enjoy Torchlight 2 heartily. All that crap sounds like a list of stinking sh** I don't want, nor ever f asked ask for, to be in the game. Not a single f ah! ounce of the shit in this list makes the single player experience better in any conceivable way. F them, they don't get my money. Of course, all these people probably went on to purchase it anyway, because the internet loves nothing more than an actionless boycott. They would regret that decision. Launch day rolls around like someone on my 600 pound life walking down a slight incline, and the shortfalls of an always online system become extremely apparent. Even those with impeccable internet were no match for the other 4.7 million gamers trying to access the game simultaneously, only to be bitch slapped with the now infamous Era 37. Now unfortunately we don't have time to go into a similar bug, Era number 34, so look up Diablo Rule 34 if you want more on that. Even if you made it past the Era 37 boss, you were then thrown dick first into a queue regardless of whether you were playing single player or not. In typical Blizzard fashion, they vastly underestimated how many people wanted to play the sequel to one of the most beloved games of all time, and scrambled to keep up with the demand. Naturally, this drew the ire of millions of would-be players, who responded by making some very dated 2012 memes. Errors, cues, and issues continued over time, until supply was finally able to meet demand, and people could, at the very least, log in. However, you are still shit out of luck if you live somewhere with bad internet. So what was worth breaking your entire game over? Oh right, another way to make money. Diablo 2 had a very crude trading system. You were able to open a trade window with another player, but only as long as you were in the same lobby as they were. This meant that, in order to trade items, you would have to start a multiplayer game, title it whatever you were trying to trade, wait for a player to join you, and then hope that they don't waste your time. I mean, this was the method that was officially endorsed by Blizzard, by the way. Unfortunately, this meant that the multiplayer game selection mode was clogged up with people asking for trades, meaning players had to metaphorically pan for gold in order to find a lobby to, you know, actually play the game. Gameplay problems were only intensified by D2JSP. This external, unofficial website was originally set up around botting in Diablo 2, but later became the main trading hub for the game. Instead of trading in-game gold, players would exchange a currency exclusive to the website, known as Forum Gold. Forum Gold was purchased using real-life money, 
and became a way to trade real currency for in-game items. There was no way to actually cash out forum gold, however, meaning the only people to actually make any dough off this were the people running D2JSP. With forum gold now the preferred currency for Diablo trading, the actual in-game currency became near worthless and rapidly inflated in value. This took the power out of Blizzard's hands, as the game had been designed around a certain level of gold acquisition and spending which were now completely irrelevant. This meant if you wanted to seriously gear out your little dude, you were either forced to turn to forum gold or bottom. Keen to not see a repeat of this in Diablo 3, Blizzard implemented auction houses that used both gold and real life money. While this solved one problem, it conveniently spawned 15 more. Diablo 3 was now officially pay to win, as anyone with a fat enough wallet and poor budgeting skills can now pay their way to power. Unlike in real life, where rich people have no real advantages. Now this wasn't as bad as in other pay to win games, as Diablo 3 had almost no player versus player on launch, and their planned PvP modes were quietly pushed down an elevator shaft when nobody was looking. PvP is where paying for power becomes a real sticking point, as nothing feels worse than losing a match, not because you were outplayed, but because you are outpaid. Instead, paying for power in a player versus environment game essentially saves you time. Except that time would have been spent playing a video game, which is meant to be fun. So you've essentially just paid money so that you don't have to have fun. I'm sure some people will argue that, oh, you, you're just cutting out the boring grind, but I mean, what do you think happens when you have the best gear in the game? Conveniently, Blizzard also takes a cut of every sale made on the real money auction house. Initially, these were meant to be a flat rate per item instead of a percentage cut. Percentages really incentivize us to manipulate the system, and we don't even want the incentive to do that, much less actually do it. We expect it'll break even, lead designer Jay Wilson says. While equipment such as armor and weapons ended up having a flat fee of one US dollar per sale, Commodities like gems, materials and the like ended up having a 15% cut of the final sale price. The Real Money Auction House was also one of the primary motivators behind the game's always online nature. This was to ensure that players couldn't hack or cheat the game while offline in order to spawn in powerful high-end items that they could then flip for a profit on the Real Money Auction House. But it turns out they wouldn't even need to as the drop rates for powerful gear in Diablo 3's early days were so high that the Real Money Auction House found itself flooded with cheap, powerful gear. While I suppose this is preferable to the idea of a $50 sword, if you can just buy a full set of high level gear for a few bucks, I mean, why would you even bother trying to get it normally? To compensate, Blizzard then skewed the drop rate in the opposite direction, meaning it was now hard to get cool items for your character in a game about getting cool items for your character. After 22 months, Blizzard decided to remove the Real Money Auction House, citing how it undermines the gameplay of killing monsters and getting cool loot, something that players have been telling them ever since it was first announced. In the end, lead designer Jay Wilson estimated that the Real Money Auction House made between 10 to 15 million dollars. Now, for a lot of game companies, that might sound like a lot, but for Blizzard, that's just their weekly breast milk budget. I love Diablo Immortal because it feels like Blizzard designed it with snarky YouTube videos in mind. This thing has just been a perpetual scandal ever since it was announced. At BlizzCon 2018, the first new Diablo game in years was rumored to be announced. A Diablo panel announcing what's next for the franchise was said to take place on the main stage immediately following the opening ceremony. This spot is usually reserved for major game announcements and fans theorized that this would be none other than Diablo 4. So you can imagine the immense disappointment when this crowd of primarily PC gamers were treated to the announcement of Diablo Immortal, a mobile game. Now you have to imagine just how awful your game is for your super fans who paid a pretty penny to be there and will clap at pretty much anything, are booing you on your own stage. One legend continued the BlizzCon tradition of wearing a red shirt and calling out the developers during the Q&A panel by asking, is this uh, an out of season April Fool's joke? <laughs> uh... Another asked if there were any plans to port Immortal to PC, which spawned this now infamous line. Do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones, phone, right? As Immortal clawed its way closer to release, 
Skepticism amongst fans began to boil over. In order to develop the game, Blizzard teamed up with Chinese addiction developer NetEase, in the same way that bikey gangs team up with Chinese fentanyl distributors. NetEase is a company that doesn't so much produce games as a series of flashing lights that turns money into glimpses of serotonin for those with addictive personalities. Their previous game, Crusaders of Light, had top players spending upwards of 20 grand in order to be the very best like no one ever was. Furthering fans' frustrations, it seemed as though Diablo Immortal was a reskin of another NetEase game, Endless of God. Man, can we just send like one English speaking person over to Asia to tell these game companies whether or not their names sound fucking stupid or not? Maybe we can finally bring to justice whoever named the game Bravely Default. Skepticism reached an all time high when it was discovered that Belgium and the Netherlands, in a complete Chad move, preemptively banned the game because of their strict laws on loot boxes. The game drops and, to nobody's surprise, the game is monetization hell. A shame too because buried under all of the psychological manipulation is actually a half decent Diablo game. Besides throwing out every creepy money hungry trick in the book, the game also milks its whales worse than any other mobile game. And that's saying something. In order to completely max out a character, it was initially estimated that you'd have to spend around $100,000. Of course, no one's forcing you to spend money. You also have no obligation to max out your character, but what, you're just gonna finish the story mode and then move on to another game? Like a fucking weirdo? These massive figures are primarily based on legendary gems, one of the key ways of increasing your character's power at max level. Gems are rated out of five stars. And on top of that, there's a secondary rating system for 5 star gems, which again goes up to 5. So the best gem you could find is a 5 star level 5 quality gem. In order to get these gems, you have to run Elder Rifts, which are short randomized dungeons. Of course, you can't just expect to run a dungeon for free. So without spending real money on a legendary crest, your Elder Rift will never drop a legendary gem. Even if you do spend real money, there's only a 4.5% chance of getting a 5 star legendary gem for every legendary crest purchased. And then on top of that, a 1% chance of that 5 star gem being a level 5 quality one. That means for every legendary crest purchased, there's a 0.045% chance, or 1 in every 2222 runs, of getting a perfect gem. Each crest costs 160 of the game's premium currency which is around $4.50 Australian. So assuming you have the worst luck on the planet, which you probably do if your brain's willing to let you spend this much on a video game, that would be around $10,000 per perfect gem. Oh, but it doesn't end there. You also have to level up your gems. To do this, you need duplicate legendary gems and gem power, which you can get from salvaging unwanted legendary gems, or you guessed it, purchased from the store. In order to level your gem up to level 10, the max level, you would need 74 legendary gems and 4450 gem power. You would then need to do this 6 times for the 6 pieces of gear that you can put gems into. Initial estimates put this at around $100,000 with average luck in order to fill all 6 slots with perfect gems. Oh, what, do you think that was all? There's more. It turns out Blizzard added in a secret surprise mechanic just for whales. Upon leveling your gem up to max level, which is no small feat in itself, you were then given the option to awaken the gem. This allows five additional gems to be super glued onto the original gem. While these additional gems don't need to be five stars in order to get the maximum benefit, they still need to be leveled up to 10 the same way as the rest. Now, if you think this is needlessly confusing for no discernible reason, you're right. Mobile game developers use strategies such as these to obfuscate power and muddle the value of purchases, so that $50 pack seems more valuable than it really is. Although, let's be fair, no amount of smoke and mirrors should be able to convince you that $10,000 is a reasonable amount of money to spend on a video game let alone a single item in a video game. So you're probably thinking, oh, this is surely just wishful thinking on Blizzard's part. Nobody's gonna spend six figures in order to be the best at the worst version of Diablo. Nope, at least one content creator did exactly that. It turns out having a character that powerful means the game can't find anyone of equal power to matchmake you against, 
rendering his uber-powerful juggernaut unable to flex the fortune he'd invested in it. The uproar around this was overwhelming. Content creators and Diablo fans lined up to kick Diablo Immortal in the head out the back of a pub in New Hampshire at 2am. But if pop culture boycotts and political results are anything to go by, what people complain about online versus what the casual majority engage in are often two completely different things. Despite being review bombed on Metacritic, to the point that it's now the lowest rated user score ever, it still has a respectable 4.6 stars on both app stores. Not only that, but in the game's first five months, it reportedly made over $300 million in microtransactions. Which makes you wonder why anybody bothers anymore. All the while, an objectively better version of the game, like Diablo 2 or 3, still exists. And last I checked, you don't have to spend $100,000 to be good at it. Well, at least Immortal worked at launch. Diablo's not the only Blizzard game to be engulfed in scandals. Check out my World of Warcraft video for more on that. Or why not check out the Mini Scandals playlist for more hobby dramas you've never heard of. Oh, and don't forget to check out Gamersups if you're in the market for some energy source.